Hi, all. Again, this is Mara Fine calling in from the Jewish Funders Network in New York, and we are really excited for this webinar this afternoon um, to discuss the intersection of Jewish identity, whiteness, and privilege. Today we have Terry Yaffe, a JFN member, who is a fantastic part of our organization. We're really excited to hear her story and to hear why she's passionate about this topic. We also have Alana Kaufman calling in from the Bay Area. Um, she is with the JCRC there, and she's been working on this issue in depth for many, many years. And she, along with Mark Dollinger from San Francisco State University, are going to speak to us today. So without further ado, go ahead and, uh, and we can get started. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you all for joining Terry, Mark, and me. We'd like to welcome you. And um, as part of the frame and introduction, I would like to talk a little bit about what you can expect today and what we need from you to fully engage in this opportunity to learn and to work together. Uh, both Mark, rather Mark, Terry, and myself will be doing some presentation of big ideas and concepts. We're going to be creating a complicated conversation. We'll each do some presentation, and then there will be time for questions and answers at the end. I'd like to encourage you all to listen with the purpose and passion that you bring to this work where we're thinking about and talking about and grappling with our identity as Jews, our experiences with race and power and privilege, how we engage in an important movement around racial justice in the United States, and how we can leverage our opportunities with philanthropy to make lasting change in the community as citizens and as Jews. Um, I'd like you to think about what you'd like to bring to this conversation, as people engage in this work, and I'd like you to think about what you'd like to take away from this conversation as you fully engage in your work around these issues. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is there are more than 90 people on this call around the world today coming into this conversation because these are important issues that matter to all of us. I want you to picture yourselves this morning and this afternoon as part of an ecosystem in a Jewish community, 90 people, 90 entities connected by these themes that really matter to us. And I want you to imagine that we, when we finish this webinar together, you will have um, new information, new power, and new community to use um, as a source of inspiration to engage in with all of this work. And so without further ado, we're going to begin with Mark Dollinger. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark. And I'll start with a personal story. At my previous university, uh, I was I was simply the golden child, and I enjoyed privilege. At a community college, I was a PhD professor, which was unusual, a research-driven historian, and I learned a white, middle-class, straight man. So when I wanted to teach in an all-expense-paid semester in Florence, Italy, I became the first non-tenured faculty member ever given the opportunity to go. And the next year, I was the first non-tenured faculty member to ever serve as the director of the Florence Italy Study Abroad Program. And then one day, it seemed, I lost my privilege. A group of seven white, non-Jewish, and well-connected senior faculty let me know that they'd invited a Jewish terrorist to be their featured speaker on the Holocaust. They told me that they wanted to turn a large lecture hall full of non-Jewish students into an episode of, well, their own version of the Jerry Springer show. And they were going to use the Holocaust as their focus. I exercised my right to dissent. I did it in the most civil and respectful way I could. Yet when I refused to back down from my dissent, these senior colleagues turned up the heat. They gave up my name to the Jewish terrorist who came and taped his business card to my door. I called the police chief to see if I could get an escort on campus. He refused an escort, in fact, told me we needed more people like that terrorist. I went right up the line, faculty union, academic senate, right to the office of the college president, who called me an oddball to, his, to my face. The editor of the student newspaper, who I learned used to babysit for this uh, individual's children, gave him a column where he called for my firing and for the firing of my dean who stood in my defense. This invited speaker's organization had a motto of every Jew were 22 and stay alive with the 45. 
So when I demanded that campus police enforce our school's no firearm policy and deploy the police to protect students, the police chief did deploy the police, but he did it in a broom closet in the hallway in order to arrest students who'd shown up to protest the lecture. I felt so unsafe that I got out of Dodge. I headed to Princeton University, a place where a white male published research historian gets to go. And after a year there, my African-American colleague Milton from, the, from, uh, from my college called me and said, Mark, you got to come back. There are people here uh, who do not have the privilege that you do to get to go off to the Ivy League, and you need to protect them. So I came back only to learn in the year that followed that they fired my dean for protecting me. They arrested Milton for false allegations of making a threat against a white woman. And, uh, and with that, I moved to SF State, where I have taught for the last 14 years. This is how I learned most personally and most painfully about whiteness, uh, power, and privilege. Whiteness, to give a bit of an academic introduction, is actually what's called a social construction. Uh, it's not actually scientific. It's not just about the color of your skin. It's really about relationship to power. And over history, uh, societies have invented whiteness. And we say invented because if you imagine each of us have, let's say, 16 great-great-grandparents, whatever it is that gets us to 16, let's say 15 of them are Italian and one is Irish we would be known as Italian. But if 15 were Italian and one was African, we'd be known as black. And in US history, this is called the one drop rule. One drop of African blood makes you black. It also turns out that who was white and who was not changes over time. And uh, the Irish in the middle of the 19th century in Boston were actually called the black Irish. And socially, they were lower than African Americans uh, on the social order. And there's been a lot of critique of African Americans, such as Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, who, because of their conservative politics, are actually accused of being white. So with the Black Lives Matter movement as it is growing, questions of Jews, of whiteness, of power, of privilege, have come into full focus in the Jewish community. It's what inspired me to get involved with all of this. And I hand back to you, Ilana, to talk a little bit about race and racism in the Jewish community. Thank you, Mark. So by way of context, I come to this conversation with all of you as a professional on the ground, working every day with a very unique set of vantage points. I've been a program officer at a national federation, Jewish Federation, involved in philanthropy and grant making and organizational development. I've been and am a community coalition builder, an advocate, a diplomat, and an ambassador working across communities and a problem solver. I come with you, to you with a perspective as a translator for our Jewish community with communities that we don't often successfully interact with, a navigator, an interpreter, and a guide. I work in Jewish, formal Jewish organiz organizational spaces with communities of color, and I come to you as an African American, a Jew, and a Jewish communal professional. And I want to just sort of give you a caveat to everything I'm going to say, which is I, I work with all of you as colleagues. And so I'm going to tell you what I see on the ground in terms of our ability to, co to coalition build with African Americans, to understand the issues of racial injustice from the perspectives of African Americans at this time. I'm going to talk about what our opportunities are, what the issues are, and I'm going to start with what our liabilities are as an organized Jewish community. The other thing I want to say is I'm not going to be speaking about race and racism in the Jewish community in a linear fashion, but I want you to understand these concepts as overlapped and integrated all of the time, because no one of us is part of just a single community, and no one of us interacts as an individual entity without bumping into other communities. And I want to start off by talking about coalition building, civil rights, and our liabilities in working with African American community. When I'm working with African American communities as a representative and a diplomat of the formal Jewish community, some big questions come up from our African American colleagues 
that help inform us as a Jewish community about concepts that are essential in coalition building. How do we create trust? How do we create authentic and honest relationships? And how do we work together as not only equal partners, but equitable partners to support advancing racial justice, to deepen the coalitions between black folks and Jews so that we can work together as allies? And how do we as a Jewish community use our core Jewish values to put a real dent and make a real impact in the effects of racial injustice in the United States. Some of the things I've heard and learned from our African American communities as they perceive working with the Jewish communities is that they have real questions about us as Jews because we have not dealt with our own internal Jewish community racism. Jewish communities have a long history of having difficult relationships with African Americans in addition to wonderful relationships around the civil rights movement. Every community that is raised in the United States or comes to the United States learns the social issues that Mark talked about in terms of the, the construction of race. And we teach racism in our communities through our actions, through our words, through our approaches, and through our inaction. African Americans wonder at what point the Jewish community will grapple with its own racism and without understanding that, there is an issue of trust about the role of Jewish communities in helping to affect real change in terms of racial injustice. They challenge our credibility, which is a fair observation. African-American community leaders have told me that this idea that Jews see African-Americans as a group to help, as the other, a spirit of noblesse oblige is problematic. This context is not one of charity. It is one where there have been social constructions of race that have deeply seeped into our constructs of policies, systems, and structures in the United States. And this is a problem to solve. This is not a group of sad people to help or fix. African-American leaders have told me that it does not necessarily deepen the relationship to leverage our historical story as slaves escaping Mitzrayim, leaving Egypt. When one compares the slavery story of the Jews and the slavery story of African Americans in the United States, the takeaway is that African Americans often feel like Jews do not understand the depth, the reality, and the catastrophe of 500 years of institutionalized slavery in the United States. And it is not that there is not value in this shared narrative of slavery, there certainly is. But when deconstructing it within a modern racial justice context, there is no real comparison. African American leaders have told me, as we have told them, that 20% of our Jewish community in the United States are people of color and people of ethnic backgrounds. They wonder why it is that our systems, our structures, our Jewish communal organizations, our Jewish communal leaders, our educators, in no way reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the Jews in the United States. And this causes a question because the Jewish organizational system has repeated or built in the same structures of racism that we see outside of the Jewish community. And African-American leaders and working with Jewish community leaders wonder in what way we, A, have perpetuated these same systems, and B, how we might solve them. But more importantly, C, what is it about the people of color in the Jewish community, those of ethnic backgrounds in the Jewish community, what is it about them, about us, about me, that makes it disfavorable to, to authentically include and integrate Jews of color and ethnic backgrounds into the United States Jewish communal system. And again, when there is a paucity of the diversity of the, of the true Jewish community in the United States, when there's a paucity reflected in Jewish communal organizations, for communities of color and African Americans, it brings up a question of credibility, of honesty, and the, the ability to understand the Jewish community doing its own work around racism so that it can be in a strong position to work outside of the Jewish community as allies with African Americans around racism. 
I also want to mention the importance of understanding social justice spaces. Social justice spaces in the United States are based on coalition building. They're based on communities of color, the LGBTQ community coming together, women and feminists coming together, and those who um, are, are identified as having differences from the common norm that was established over time in the United States. There are very few Jews who are not people of difference. <laughs> in fact, Jews are people of difference. And so in some ways, we need to more fully integrate and understand ourselves as people of diversity. And at the same time, we need to understand, understand ourselves as people of diversity in coalition building and the importance of doing that work. I would also add a couple of other examples. And this is a, a, a complicated one that we can grapple with over time. In looking at the national racial justice movement, and in looking at the global situation around people of color, mostly those with black and brown skin around the globe, and the historical experiences of colonization and oppression, in the African American community, there is a sense of shared narrative with people of color around the globe who have been oppressed or colonized. This is not a one-to-one -one shared narrative. There are not specific historical similarities to call upon, but in a racial justice movement, there is empathy for the brothers and sisters around the globe who are experiencing racism too. This begs the question of the issues going on in Israel and Palestine and the importance of being able to speak about them out loud and grapple with the complexity of them in real and honest time. It is not that we as an organized Jewish community have to have a specific perspective on this issue, but if we don't talk about it, and if we don't talk about it with our African American brothers and sisters who are paying attention, then we are not creating a situation where we can have honest relationship building conversations. I will close with a couple of other comments. Um, we have core systems in our domestic Jewish community that enable community building. We have structures of Jewish values, we have structures of power and privilege, and we have resources and assets. To not leverage those opportunities and resources to grapple with our own internal Jewish community racism, to build up our Jews of color and our Jews of ethnic background, and to integrate them fully into the organized Jewish community so that they can only, not only that they can participate, but they can bring their experiences, their wisdom, their perspective, means that we are getting in the way of our own internal Jewish community coalition building. We are creating obstacles for our own Jewish community building in relation to other communities. And we are getting in the way of our own opportunity to advance these themes of justice. And with that, Mark, I'm gonna pass it back to you. All right, thank you. So um, thank to those you, uh, white those, Jews uh, in the audience, I ask the, uh, the uh, somewhat, somewhat rhetorical question. question. On the affirmative, the affirmative action, action forms, form. what space do you check? It's largely a generational answer in terms of, of audiences with whom I have spoken. White Jews don't think they're white because they're Jews, and they can't find Jewish listed on the form. Yet, even as Jews who self-perceive difference they also still enjoy privilege. And when this happens, as Ilana was just mentioning, it complicates white Jews in the eyes of communities of color. So what I want to do is kind of give a quick um, historical overview to this um, theme of Jews and whiteness. And to say that in many ways, uh, at least in US history, Jews, Jews are, are, are fairly unique. We're the only group that has really switched back and forth from whiteness and away from whiteness over time. Um, between, let's say, 1870 and 1920, the time of the massive Eastern European Jewish immigration to the US, um, Jews were not considered white, at least in American society. Um, but actually, it was a good thing not to be considered white because what sort of Christian America um, imposed upon its Jewish minority was that Jews were smart and thoughtful and bookish and um, good, strong families. So all of the attributes of the category of Jewish um, was something that um, Jews enjoyed. 
So they did not object at all to being outside of whiteness. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, this, this took a terrible turn in the 1920s and 30s um, when, when Jews were not considered white, but it became a bad thing because it became associated with the scientific anti-Semitism, which ultimately led you know, in, in Germany to the attempted genocide of the Jews. Uh, so from this period, we had the highest level of American anti-Semitism in U.S. history, and we had uh, American Jews marginalized as non-white. Most of the scholars who are writing in this field uh, acknowledge that at least by the 1950s, American Jews had, uh, white uh, Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews had become white, that the anti-Semitic barriers of the earlier decades had evaporated, that Jews were able to move into white Christian suburbs, they were able to go to university and graduate school, they were able to get jobs in corporations that wouldn't hire Jews and ultimately make partner and do all of the things that, uh, that they were unable to before. I think the best illustration of the history of Jews and whiteness is one word, quotas. Because if you say the word quota to um, an identified Jewish person, it tends to get a very strong and emotional reaction. I'm actually fascinated more by the reaction than I am by the word quota itself. Because you hear back in popular conception that in the 1920s, quotas uh, were used in order to keep Jews out and that it was an anti-Semitic thing and that it was a terrible thing. And that when quotas came back after affirmative action in the 1960s and 1970s, of course American Jews need to oppose quotas because American Jews know that quotas are anti-Semitic. The problem is that that narrative completely misses this interesting mobility that uh, Jews have around whiteness. Because in the 1920s, quotas were instituted to keep whites in power and to keep communities of color out of power. And in the 1920s, that meant that African Americans and Jews were out of power uh, and sort of white Protestant elite remained in. By the 1960s and 70s, when institutional racism became more clear to at least white liberals, uh, the Great Society under President Johnson decided that they needed to bring in quotas with the opposite effect. That is, try to make sure communities of color get their fair share of power. And if you're going to marginalize anyone on the outside, let, let the traditionally white powerful group move to the margins for the moment. So if you were white, you loved quotas in the 20s and you hated them in the 60s. If you were black, you hated them in the 20s and you loved them in the 60s. American Jews were the only group that hated them both times because the difference between those two decades demonstrates how white Jews moved from outside of whiteness to inside of whiteness. So really the question of Jews and whiteness and privilege and power is about a monumental shift in Jewish history, where for most of our history it's been powerlessness. Whiteness and modernity has brought Jews into power. Here in the United States, since World War II, the Jewish community has had to embrace what it's like for the first time to actually be in power. Uh, the state of Israel came into power in 1948, and the creation of a Jewish army, of course, brings that question into even greater focus in Mideast politics. So I think what we've arrived at is a moment where Jews need to face the implications of power and privilege. And this really goes to something else Ilana was mentioning, this concept of Jews and the other. And that is that much of Jewish social justice has been predicated on the notion that Jews as a group that hasn't been categorized as white is helping the other. But anytime any group helps the other group, they're not other. And that means that we enjoy the whiteness and the power and the privilege, which can actually be quite offensive. So what we have here is a really important moment when we construct our understanding of social justice and of whiteness and of privilege, and we look at the question as us and them, which is already problematic, what if us is in fact them? What if we are inverting ourselves upon ourselves 
And for that, Ilana, I hand it back to you. Thank you, Mark. So I want to catch Mark's ball and talk about racial justice through a philanthropic lens and Jewish values and why strategic engagement really, really matters. And I want to start off by saying, first of all, what's at stake? And I want to just paint a picture. As of this moment, the Pew study on American Jews told us in 2013 that almost three out of every four non-Orthodox Jews will marry non-Jews. And if you hold that thought and add it to the fact that the U.S. Census tells us that in 2042, half of the United States will be people of color. And moving forward from that point, white people of whom, among whom Jews now find ourselves and themselves will become the minority moving forward in the United States. So the context in which we've understood race and power and privilege is dramatically changing. And as I mentioned earlier, in the United States, dated and very conservative data tells us that 20% of Jews are racially and ethnically diverse. And so when you think about that context and you look at our philanthropic organizations and our Jewish communal ecosystem, you can see that there's something terribly wrong. And this is not a criticism, this is an observation. But there's something terribly wrong with our representation, our power in terms of who's making decisions, and allocating resources, and who's informing and helping to hold this conversation. And if we actually deepen who's involved in this conversation, we will not only make better decisions as philanthropic entities, but we will make decisions that have a more positive and lasting effect on those with whom we're engaging with our philanthropic efforts. Philanthropy at its root is about a love of humanity. And that is squarely within a context of a core Jewish value of Gimilut Hasidim, the giving of loving kindness. So our work as philanthropists is our work as Jews, and they are one and the same. We are here to promote welfare, human welfare. We also have to look at Maimonides and the eight levels of giving. And the most noble level of giving is that which allows somebody to not have to depend on someone else, to empower them with what they need to be propelled forward into their sense of personal empowerment and action. And so how we think about our work as philanthropists is guided by who we are and what we do as Jews. Philanthropic expressions are Jewish expressions. And I encourage us to stay squarely in that space around our Jewish values. I would add our Jewish values around equity and fairness and respect as ways to guide our thinking about good grant making as, and good philanthropy as we think about racial justice. But I would also add this idea that as we own as an organized Jewish community the overwhelming reality within a contemporary, socially constructed racial context that Jews are white for those who are Ashkenazi by background and and, 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 and family, then it helps us understand how other communities perceive Jews in terms of power and privilege as we navigate philanthropic relationships. Our opportunities. As we think about philanthropy, as we think as individual philanthropists, uh, donor advised fund managers and holders, foundations, uh, philanthropic entities and federations, what I would encourage us to think about as we think about our grant making is, first of all, why do we give? And this is just good grant making. What is our purpose? What is our passions? What are our styles and our approaches to the kind of giving and engagement with philanthropic opportunities? And then when we think about racial justice, I want to push all of you to think about what are your specific entry points into the conversation and action around racial justice through a philanthropic lens? You have to be in touch with not only what your comfort zones are, what would feel like a stretch for you in terms of who you're engaging with and the kind of uh, social justice and racial justice action you want to take with your philanthropic efforts. But I also want you to think about in terms of who do you want to impact and affect? Individuals, groups, do you want to take on the structures and the systems of racial inequity and racial injustice? What are your capacities? 
What are your resources? What are your liabilities? And what are your deficiencies? So let's go back to something that I said in my earlier piece and Mark has been talking about so far. As you think about yourselves as philanthropic activists, philactivists, are you ready to do this work as a white person, for those of you who are white who are on this webinar, are you ready to do this work as somebody who is perceived as white? And are you ready to do this work in terms of your own skills and capacities as someone who is culturally sensitive and ready to navigate these multiracial spheres? Have you done your training on, in terms of diversity training? Have you done your work around your own racism and working through that? Um, what are your relationships with African Americans? The Washington Post tells us that 75% of white people have no non-white friends. And those same 75% have entirely white people in their social networks and their professional networks. So if you are trying to do big impact work in the African American community, if you are trying to undo some of these systems and structures that have reinforced racism in the United States, how far are you away from authentic relationships with African Americans? How far away are you from intimacy with the African American community that helps you think about yourself as an agent of change and as an agent of that number one, that highest level of Maimonides giving where you are helping propel somebody to do for themselves? How far are you away from being able to do that effectively and what do you need to get there? Some other questions. When you think about your entry point into this conversation with philanthropy, what is your capacity or your foundation's capacity or your fund's capacity to hold space for some of the dynamics that come with the racial justice movement as it's currently expressed in the United States? The Black Lives Matter movement does not make everybody comfortable. It doesn't make all the white people comfortable, and it doesn't make all black people comfortable. It's, you know, it's a dynamic robust, powerful, innovative movement. And so can you hold space for the whole of the movement so that you can engage in a way where black folks don't feel like you're being critical of their movement or that they in some way have to curtail their movement to be in a philanthropic relationship with you? Can you hold space for some of the perceptions that African Americans have about the Jewish community, about whiteness and power and can you hold that space in a way that is honest, that you're holding space for African Americans? And can you do it in a way that deepens the relationship so that you can lean and build toward trust? Can you hold space for the sense of the shared narrative of people of color around the world, that black and brown folks have an experience of being marginalized and oppressed? For people of color, many of us feel like it is a, a, a kinship, a global kinship and that it does not necessarily activate us toward one direction or another, but we understand this shared experience of racism. Can you hold space for the shared narrative of racism around the globe? Can you hold space for no matter the range of perspectives on Israel? Can you hold space for the African American community to have diverse and complicated perspectives on Israel the same way we try to hold space inside the Jewish community for complicated perspectives on Israel. And then one of the other things I really want to talk about is it is essential in bringing our philanthropic energy and resources to the racial justice movement that we do it in a way that models outstanding and exceptional grant making and stewardship of the philanthropic relationship. There are a lot of great intentions. There's a lot of impulse out there to do something and to act and to act now. And as grant makers, as philanthropists, as philanthropic organizations, including outstanding, excellent grant making policies and practices is what will allow us to make sure we are not only doing this philanthropic activity in a way that is value added, the African American community into the racial justice movement, but that it doesn't have any unintended consequences. And I will give you an example. There um, is a famous Jewish philanthropic foundation that no longer exists, 
but there was a time during the civil rights movement when this foundation founded hundreds and hundreds of schools in the South. And this foundation used its resources to help African Americans not only in the school context, but this foundation was interested in the healthcare industry and arena. This foundation funded a study to explore the impact of a virus and an illness on the African American community with the idea that this study would then lend itself toward creating a vaccine and a remedy for this illness in the African American community. This foundation's funding structure changed in the middle of this study, and the data that had originally been developed to find a cure for this illness ended up being used to watch the impact of this illness on this African American community in the absence of being able to fund the vaccine for the cure. And I'm being, um, I am intentionally not naming the foundation or the specific illness, but the impact is a historically catastrophic event on the African American community. So when I was asked to host a group of people to watch a film about this foundation's excellent work creating schools for black children in the South, and I was expected to invite African-American community members to come together to dialogue about this wonderful Jewish community member who did all of these nice things for black people. The African-Americans wanted to see the film, but they wanted to talk about the complex relationship. They wanted to talk about the impact of the health studies on the black community. They wanted to talk about what bad grant making looks like when it even has good intentions. Because their perspective was, this was a complex philanthropist that had both excellent and catastrophic impacts on the African-American community. When I tried to work through this story, the Jewish community had not really heard about this relationship and the impact on the health issues with the African-American community. And the Jewish community had only heard about the good things that happened with the schools. And when you study this as a case study, you can see that if you look at the financial structure of this foundation in the historical context, it was entirely unlikely that they would have ever been able to finish their study anyway. The point being that what looks like excellent grant making from a Jewish perspective or an excellent philanthropic effort from a Jewish perspective might be, both be seen as an excellent opportunity for the African American community, but there might be other parts to the story or other pieces to the puzzle that make the conversation complicated, but it also makes the conversation honest. And if we are unable to have honest and complicated conversations with our African-American community partners, and if we are unable to model our grant making and our philanthropic activity in a way that helps us predict unintended consequences, then we're not doing our best grant making work. There are many, many opportunities for us all to plug in. It takes courage. It takes passion. It takes self-knowledge. It takes honest inventories and assessments of ourselves as professionals, our capacities to navigate diverse communities, the training that we've built in for our organizations so that they have both the people and the systems and structures in place to be equitable and equal. And it takes a leap of faith and some courage because grappling with racial injustice is difficult and it's also inspiring. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Terry. Thank you. Hi everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to be here. Um, I just wanted to introduce who I am. Um, I grew up in Detroit, and that almost sort of speaks for itself. It deeply influenced my worldview, uh, especially I grew up alongside economically, ethnically, and racially diverse families, m many of whom I respected, loved, called my friends. Um, I also had many wonderful experiences with Judaism, even though I was raised as a Catholic uh, until about age 10. Um, and again, thanks to my father's business partner who lovingly included us in his family's weekly and holiday home rituals. So, and then in high school, my best friend converted to Judaism, and I ended up on a research internship going to Israel as a college student. I met my husband, I fell in love with him, with Israel and Judaism. And so when it came time to get married, the whole idea of converting to Judaism was just a very easy idea. 
And I had a wonderful person, Ari Carton, shout out to him, anybody who knew, knew him at the Hillel at Stanford, worked with me uh, to kind of do a customized conversion, and I just had an incredible experience, learning experience. And then early years as a Jew, I always viewed myself as an other. And today, I would say much, much less so, but still a little bit of the other. Um, my experiences in the community have been rich, varied, um, and I've always focused on social justice, education issues, and Jew most importantly, Jewish identity. And between Hillel um, for the conversion and activities in the Jewish community as a, uh, co in college, and then later with the Federation, the Reform Movement, and the Wexner Heritage Foundation, I just feel like I've been embraced and taught so well about the depths of Judaism and the need that we have to build a welcoming community that's so proud of our legacy. Um, I can't believe my phone's ringing. Uh, sorry. <laughs> that's off. Um, so I guess what I'm, my role here today is kind of what are the um, basics that I think through as I'm investing in um, social justice work and um, building relationships across different communities. So I, I guess I first, my most basic idea is that I really truly believe in the concept that humankind was made in God's image. And that means that um, I believe that we are all members of the same village, and um, I accept and befriend those who don't look or sound like me. And then I think within our own communities, um, I know this was a, a reference uh, um, already by Alana, is that the future is, and actually already the past has been, that we need to accept and love those who've fallen in love with our children, who will fall in love with our children, and will more than likely have and raise our grandchildren. Um, and then I think with deciding how you're going to be approaching the whole matter of relationships across uh, races and ethnic or uh, communities is I think you need to allow yourself time to reflect on how you can build relationships across the very high barriers that exist in many of our communities. And that means you must acknowledge and commit to know what institutional racism really means, not just in general in the United States, but in specifically in your community and then just in your congregation. And then how we um, have been and are continuing to practice it in our communities, in our laws, and in our institutions. And I think with that, all that already done, I would then come to the table to listen first. Don't come to lead. We're often always kind of showing up to be the leaders. And be respectful. Keep listening. Keep asking questions to confirm your understanding of what's being shared with you. Um, and then when you see things that are morally wrong happening in your community, have the courage to call them out. Because if we just stand by, we will continue to have these um, barriers. And then I would say build respectful and loving relationships with family, friends, and community members so we can move forward to build a just, safe, and healthy world together. Um, be authentic. Don't just walk into any organization you think you want to help. Raise expectations and then leave and not follow through. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves. You're going to have to learn a lot. You're going to have to leave um, your ego at the door. That's not always easy for many of us. And uh, the most important and the hardest part is you have to keep trying because there's uh, so much work to do. Um, I would learn about what the JFN Social Justice Fund has been about, what its purpose was, um, the extent you can learn about its impact. I, want, I have to give a shout out to my beloved Join for Justice, um, which brought me and introduced me to JFN. 
Um, and maybe we all together should consider developing a round two for a social justice fund under JFN. Um, so um, I would just do that. And um, uh, I think we need much more of us investing in the work that's being done already and work that we haven't even discovered yet. So I. I think that's really all I want to say. Thank you so much, Terry and Alana and Mark, um, for an amazing, um, incredibly informative presentation. I've been chatting with participants who are you know, really excited, have been answering some of your uh, questions that were a little bit rhetorical, a little bit required, um, required some answering. Um, before we move on to questions and answers, I wanted to just give a little bit more context to what the Jewish Funders Network is and why we're so engaged um, in this conversation. Our mission um, is to work with Jewish funders as individuals and as collectives to improve the way that they're giving and maximize their impact and to make the best possible change in the world along with them as philanthropists. And with that in mind, we're really interested and committed in having these conversations, having these juicy, important conversations that do create discomfort. And I want to thank Alana so much for pointing that out, that there is discomfort in this. And, and to Mark also for pointing out the major shifts that have happened for us as Jews over the past, I mean, less than 100 years in terms of our whiteness, in terms of our privilege. Um, and it's, an, it's a conversation that we have in the office, it's a conversation we have with our with our funders, and that's why we wanted to have this program, and why also we'll be having a program with Alana and Mark at our conference, which is in San Diego on April 3rd. Um, and in addition, just to follow up on what Terry was saying about the Jewish Social Change Match, the Jewish Social Change Match, which funded over two million dollars into Jewish organizations making um, change on these issues. Uh, we welcome funders on this call to join us at um, at conference from April 3rd to April 5th and to continue this conversation and definitely to continue to be in touch with us if, as Terry suggested, there is interest in, in developing a fund for this. Um, so definitely let's keep this conversation going. And um, please send in now any questions that you may have. I have one or two that came in throughout the presentation. Um, and a couple of comments as well that I'll be I'll be putting forth. But anybody else has questions? Um, Alana, Terry, and Mark are here to answer them. And Alana and Mark, if you have anything else to add, um, feel free. Oh, this is Mark. I have a lot more to add, but I'll wait for the questions as my excuse. Okay. Um, this is Ilana, and I would just would love to piggyback on something that Terry shared. And um, my experience is working with those philanthropic entities and individuals who are, are, are really engaging in racial justice in a very focused way. One of the things that I find in common across pretty much everyone from the Jewish community who's engaged in this work is that they've had some experience um, that has served as a catalyst for propelling them into a place where they feel like they must, must do something and create positive change. And a lot of times these experiences are difficult and they can be negative. Some come from being in a conflict with a friend of color, where the friend of color says that the white person simply just doesn't understand and you know, the relationship becomes broken because the distance seems too great. Sometimes it's because they have a family member who is African American or a person of color and they've experienced and observed their experiences with racism either inside the Jewish community and or outside of the Jewish community and it's too close and it requires change. Sometimes it's an experience where they themselves have um, felt othered by a community of color, by African Americans understanding that that othering is coming from a sense of being so fed up with the racist experiences that they are being, um, they are being stereotyped as a white person because of the power and privilege they have and what it feels like to be targeted by African Americans who are fed up with racism that's coming from the white community, white individuals, systems of white dominance that are part of our structures here in the United States. 
Alana. And so I wouldn't, yes. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but we have a couple questions. And okay, I want to I'm going sure to button it up. So what I wanted to say is, um, first of all, it doesn't ha you don't have to wait for something catastrophic or a catalytic event to happen to propel you to change. And second of all, um, if you're searching for your entry point into this work, go back and connect with yourself and your own experiences around catalytic experiences with communities of color as a way to, uh, to propel you forward. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. okay. Thank you so Thank much, you Alana. So I can tell I how can passionate you are about this. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear all of that. Um, so one question is uh, that many folks struggle to recruit users of color to work at their organizations. Are there tools or websites or organizations that you all know of that focus on outreach for employment opportunities for Jews of color? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, this is Ilana. I'll start with that one. And it's funny, uh, John Rosenberg, hello, thanks for the question. I was just thinking about this, this question of, a, of a, an employment firm the other day. Um, right now there are no formal organizations that work on specifically recruiting Jews of color to come into mainstream Jewish organizations. But what I would say is mainstream Jewish organizations already have the tools and the resources to recruit Jews of color. They're not using them to focus on that group. So the same way any mainstream Jewish organization is clearly trying to focus on the young adult set, ages 25 to 40 or what have you, and there are formal engagement programs in place to recruit young adults. The same way Jewish organizations have formal programs in place to cultivate leaders for um, boards, for their leadership entities, to cultivate them to be donors, quite frankly. The same pathways we already have created to recruit our LGBT uh, population, for example, into our mainstream organization, we need to be using those to recruit our Jews of color. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to equitably distribute the resources to recruit the diversity of the Jewish people into our mainstream entities. And the last thing I'll say is, and if you're looking for actual sort of where do I find esteemed, amazing Jews of color, there are some people out there, and I'd be happy to be a, re a resource offline. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, just another, another quick question um, from earlier in the presentation about the group in power being the majority group. Just a question about under apartheid, what the, pop, what the white population was like um, in South Africa. I believe there was a comparison made, and so there was a, there was a question about that to clarify. Well, I'll say uh, in terms of uh, power and privilege, it's not always the majority. If, if one has the power to uh, rule, uh, even if you don't have 51% of the population, you, one exercises that. Um, so we have many, many cases in history where minority groups, largely white groups, are able to um, control um, communities of color, even though they're not in the demographic majority. And, you know, we have a lot of conversation in, in media now that we have a lot of majority minority places. And to be sure, um, you know, when the state of California becomes majority minority, if it's not already, we're not going to see a wholesale shift in power. Uh, Frederick Douglass in 1856 said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So ultimately, I think it's an, it's an excellent question and it brings the deeper deeper point about to what extent we as Jews are willing to give up power and privilege in order to create a greater good. Thank you so much, Mark. We have a couple more minutes for a couple more questions if anyone would like to send them in. During this pause, if I could jump in with, with one other observation, it's actually a 50-year-old ob observation, um, but I, I want to say it. And that is when white Jews tend to think about racism, we tend to go back to Dr. King and the civil rights movement and Jim Crow. And that tends to be self-serving. It, it, it actually is a very complicated narrative, even in the 1950s and early 60s. But certainly, white liberal America by the mid-1960s understood that defining the word racism was not about Jim Crow and it was not about um, laws that said things. Because in 1964, federal law was passed that ended that, but racism continued. 
and really the last two generations of, of, of fighting racism have been about acknowledging institutional racism. That is the way in which it is so woven into the fabric of our society that we as whites can't even see it. And I think this is what's informing, you know, all of our comments about, about white Jews having humility and listening and not trying to lead. Um, and, and if I could just go even deeper on, on, on that excellent question uh, about how to recruit Jews of color, I think the first thing to do is to look at the ways in which institutional racism may be pervasive in Jewish organizations without even trying and the way in which the system is set up like that. Um, and that could actually be a lot less appealing to Jews of color to think that there might be a safe place for them there. Thank you, Mark. One, this is more, a lot. Please. one more question. Uh, for Alana, are there existing models of doing effective anti-racism work in the Jewish community that other communities should look into and learn from? Yes, <laughs> there are. And so I think, um, Suzanne, I mean, I can think of a couple of uh, organizations off the top of my head. And what I'd like to do is um, I can work with Merab to put together a little list and maybe we can send them out. But there are a number of organizations like Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, and the ARC, JCRC, um, Jewish Multicultural Network, Jews in All Hues. Um, Join for justice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, please. Like, yeah, I am. I'm not an exhaustive list, but there are <laughs> there are lots and lots of organizations who are taking this on and doing this work through a Jewish lens, and also doing it through a lens of sort of contemporary social justice action. And so, um, we just rattled off a set, and we could put together a little resource list. Um, but yes, uh, and um, because this will be recorded, you'll get the set that we rattled off just now. I just want to add, Terry. For those of you, like me, like sitting on many boards, boards um, um, you want to you use the opportunity, opportunity to start raising the question about diversity on your board. Um, it's pretty it's hard, hard to, to have a conversation, conversation um, racial, um, you know, relation, relationships across races and social justice if we just have one view in the room. And so I think uh, if you can uh, find the comfort to raise the question and have an open and honest conversation across to your board and in terms of board development and governance, I think it would be really uh, a meaningful and important thing to do. I think working in, working I think in the mainstream the environment, just quickly, um, it's very hard to be the only one. Um, it can be a lonely environment. There are very, very, very few Jews of color who work in the mainstream Jewish organized world. And so one is a, is a, is a, a standalone person. Two is not a powerful group. But if you get three, the data will tell you if you have three Jews of color um, or three people of color or three women, if you're working in a traditionally all-male environment, when you have three, the culture changes. And you want to go for culture change. You don't want to go for tokenism. I'll leave it at that. Okay. okay. With that, With thank that, you all thank so, you much so much for joining us today. This will be recorded. We will send around a list of resources to you. And uh, thank you all for your participation. And to Alana, Terry, and Mark, fabulous, fabulous presentations. We look forward to hearing more from you very soon. Thank you. Thank Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.